je, je m'adresse d'ores et déjà aux panélistes après la pause. Euh, je ne voulais pas poser la question parce que je ne veux pas prendre plus de temps. Euh, mais euh, j'ai été intrigué par euh, certains résultats. Par exemple, la diminution de l'initiation euh, du tabac. Euh, puis d'autre part, des effets négatifs sur certaines habitudes de vie. Et quelle analyse fait-on de, de l'atrophie du, du lien social, voire de l'influence des pères dans l'adoption euh, de certaines habitudes de vie ou leur non-adoption, qui peut fonctionner à la fois de façon positive ou négative sur les habitudes de vie, mais qui cache derrière euh, une atrophie du lien social et de l'influence sociale. Fait que ça serait, ça, j'aimerais ça peut-être avoir des, des regards croisés encore une fois cet après-midi sur cette, les éléments qui pourraient expliquer euh, ces résultats-là. OK. Alors, on troisième. On essaiera de vous répondre plus tard à, ça, à cette question. On a des bonnes explications. OK. Bien, s'il reste du temps avant, reste du temps avant euh, 15h15, vous pourrez le faire. Puis j'invite Mme Geoffroy aussi à intervenir euh, si on a du temps avant 15h15. Alors, pour avoir du temps avant 15h15, il faut commencer maintenant la troisième conférence qui va être donnée en anglais par euh, le docteur Patty Jean Nyler, qui est professeur émérite euh, à l'Université de Victoria au département des sciences de l'exercice, éducation physique et santé. Ses domaines de recherche sont les approches socio-écologiques et contextuelles de la promotion de la santé, prévention de l'obésité et des maladies chroniques, diffusion, transfert, échange de connaissances, capacité de mise en œuvre de l'organisation. Elle coordonne le laboratoire d'application et de diffusion des connaissances. Voilà, Madame Nyler, welcome. Thank you. You have, you have about 25 minutes plus about five minutes for questions. And you oh. can stay at the end because we'll, if we have five or 10 minutes, we'll uh, open the floor for questions, for more questions to all the speakers this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to share my screen here. How is that? Are we good? Good. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am very grateful be to be included in your discussions and strategies about strategies to mitigate the impact of COVID on children's cognitive, emotional, social, and physical health. What a resource Compass, the Compass survey is, so I really appreciated watching that. Um, before I begin, I want to thank Lise Govan and the organizing committee for the invitation apologize that I'm only speaking English. And I really want to acknowledge that I'm beaming into you today from the traditional unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking people in Victoria, the Esquimalt Songhees in Rosanich, whose relationship with the land continues to this day. Um, what I wanted to talk to you today was touching on what is the context for scaling up and changing health behaviors in children and youth. Why is really important to talk about scale up and implementation? What exactly the definitions, what exactly are we talking about when we use those words? And then introduce some frameworks to guide that guide the science of um, scale up and implementation. And then I'm going to come into some case studies from British Columbia. Sorry, I should have started my timer. I actually have 30 minutes just because that's hopefully I'll get through it a little quicker. Anyways. So without further ado, as a context for talking and about scale up, I thought it was really important to start with what types of settings we operate in with children and youth and where we might be intervening. You probably have already talked about these settings in your roundtables in the morning, but this, uh, this ecological model helps to situate them in the broader systems approach. And of course, we often focus on schools or childcare because children spend a lot of their waking hours there for most of their childhood and adolescence. There are skilled educational professionals that are used to delivering educational activities, experiences. And in, at least in terms of school, there's a health and wellness curriculum. But most importantly, the settings provide equitable access to, a, to health for a broad and diverse range of individuals. So here we have some of the types of settings where we would work. 
What's interesting about it is there are also settings nested within settings. So this is a school example, but within a school, which is a broad setting, there are classrooms, playgrounds, gymnasiums, hallways, all areas for health promotion. And within there, there are multiple actors within settings. So with children, it's their program leaders or their teachers, administrators, parents, and peers. And then finally, we also have multiple external influences operating on settings, public health, sport and recreation organizations, education and health and physical activity, uh, not-for-profits. So there are so many layers that interact to influence children's behaviors that we must just consider those and that it's very complex to facilitate population level change. So the challenge that ends up being addressing multiple and related health issues and outcomes with evidence-based interventions to change the multiple settings in which children live, learn, work, and play to create health for all. I know the room is filled with individuals involved with different health issues or educational issues and focuses like substance abuse, physical inactivity, mental health, unhealthy eating. It makes it really impossible to bring together in a short presentation all the evidence-based thing, evidence things we should do. So I leave you with the idea that we know a lot about what to do. We know about effective practices. You see here a physical activity example. The best investments for physical activity that were generated through ISPA um, uh, from extensive reviews of the literature and expert consultation. So you can find examples like this in health eating and tobacco. You can find expert and systematic reviews, evidence and knowledge translation units produce documents where they prioritize those things with strong evidence. Our problem is not a lack of evidence-based approaches. Our problem is the implementation gaps. This is what I like to call is, we know what works, but nobody is using it, right? So the first implementation gap is the research to practice gap. What is known is not always adopted and implemented. And what's interesting about this, some research has shown this, this Crossing this gap can take up to 17 years. So way too slow to solve problems like the reaction to COVID-19 on health behaviors. The second gap is the scale-up gap, which is evidence-based practices are not sustained or uh, scaled up. So we, we have something that works, but we don't spread it well to others. And Milat did some work on physical activity, looking at the research. We have this gap in our research too, in the scale up gap that in 2011, when he looked at physical activity studies, only 3% actually addressed dissemination or scale up. Now that has changed recently with, because we have a couple of more scale ups in the literature, but in reality, it reflects the fact that even in the research area, we have a gap. And Brownson and the work of Glasgow all highlight that if we want to put evidence into practice in real world settings, we need to figure out effective methods of disseminating or scaling up. I'm gonna just define these words, but I'm using them interchangeably. Dissemination is still more popular in the US. The 90s, we spent talking about dissemination. If any of you are old enough in the tooth to uh, remember the Canadian Heart Health Dissemination Projects, Quebec participated in one of those, but um, the more international la language has become scale up. But I'm going to talk to you about both implementation and scale up. And what are we talking about and why about implementation? So really what we're talking about is just doing it, carrying it out, executing, putting a program or intervention into use. And then if we're talking about longer term use, it can be called institu institutionalization. They're still using it. Routinization, they're still using it. Sustainability, they're still using it. And then we're gonna talk about implementation at scale. Yes, we wanna spread it, but the whole point is for them to keep using it after spread. So it's about use at scale. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about implementation. And there, there is a science around it. Here's the definition. I've added the word scale up. Some people call it implementation scale science and talk about implementation and efficacy, effectiveness and scale. But anyways, it's really the 
study of the methods to promote the systematic impact, uptake of evidence-based strategies into routine practice to improve health. And this definition says health services, I've added in health promotion. And although implementation and scale-up science is just gaining popularity, especially in Canada right now, uh, researchers have been interested for a number of decades. And there, for instance, there are well over 60 different implementation frameworks and around five pop popular scale-up mo models. Don't worry, I'm not going to introduce uh, all 60. I promise not to bore you after lunch, put you to sleep, but I am gonna introduce one or two to give you an idea of the important factors that are outlined in the frameworks. And frameworks really help give us an understanding of what the context for use is and or the determinants of use and potential places where we can intervene to make it happen. So one of my favorite frameworks that I've been using for a few years is the framework for effective implementation for Durlec and Dupree. And one of the reasons it was one of my favorites is it was emerged out of an article where they summarized reviews from prevention and health promotion programs for children. And they were trying to decide how much implementation uh, was associated with outcome and then what were the factors that were important to implementation. And so they reviewed um, five meta-analyses that covered about 600, 583 studies and looked at the connection between implementation and outcome. And 76% of the uh, studies within those meta-analyses show 70% was a positive association between implementation and at least 50% of the outcomes that were stated. So implementation is critically important to outcome. And we've actually mirrored this result uh, in a systematic review on school implementation, where we uh, showed that um, almost uh, nine out of 11 of the studies that measured implementation to outcome, they were associated with at least one outcome measure. So implementation matters. The other thing that Durlach and Dupree showed is that um, when you looked at monitoring or addressing implementation, when you are rolling things out, that it can make a difference of that uh, implementation related to two to three times higher, up to 12 times higher in outcome. So implementation matters to outcome. So that's one reason I liked it. The second reason is they reviewed 81 studies to come up with 21 factors. You see the categories here. And it looks very like ecological. There's community level factors. There's provider characteristics. Those people who are going to deliver your physical activity or tobacco prevention in the schools. Your innovation characteristics. What are you asking people to do? And then in the center, the prevention delivery system. That's if you're working in schools, that would be the schools. If you were working in work sites, that would be work sites. If you're working in community rec, that's the prevention delivery system. The prevention support system are those providing training and technical assistance. And that all leads to effective implementation. Now, Durlach and Dupree have joined forces with Wanderman, Wanderman's interactive systems framework to show you the process that happens at the center of this model. So we can get more detailed at the center where we're looking at the prevention delivery system. What is their general capacity to act? Are they overwhelmed with changes with COVID-19? That would be general capacity. What's their innovation specific capacity? Do they have skilled people? Do they have policies in place? Do they have infrastructure? So that's at the, say, example, at the school level. Then in the prevention support system, what is the general capacity building around gathering evidence, um, making sure people have the basic skills to do health promotion, and then the innovation specific things. And then finally, a nod to having distilling the information through synthesis and translation to make that information useful to people who are trying to change things. So the framework for effective implementation and the interactive systems go together. So here we have the model. What kinds of factors are within there? I won't spend a lot of time on it, but in community, we're talking about theory. I want to mention them because they relate to scale up as well. We, the importance of theory and research, the importance of political will, the importance of ongoing funding and policy. Or at the provider level, the importance that the provider perceives there's a need for what you're trying to share with them and that it gives them relative advantage or perceived benefit and that they have self-efficacy to do it. And in terms of the innovation, this is very Rogers diffusion innovation. Is it compatible with values? Is it adaptable or flexible? 
in the prevention delivery system, organizational factors look like, is there a positive work climate or are they used to integrating new programs? And finally, at the prevention support system, we're talking about training and technical assistance. There's factors under there. So this is very similar to what happens at Scale-Up as well. There are other models of uh, frameworks, and I'm just highlighting one more because it is one of the most popular implementation frameworks and most cited in the implementation science literature. Laura Downschroeder, who developed this model with colleagues, um, took a different approach than Durlek and Dupree. They said there's a lot of frameworks out there in the healthcare sector, implementation frameworks. We're gonna look at all of them and find the common factors. And from that, they came up with the consolidated framework for implementation research. And you see here, again, it looks like the ecological model. There's layers. And they talk about intervention characteristics or innovation characteristics. They talk about the inner setting, which we would call the delivery system. They call, talk about the characteristics of the in individual or the provider and the outer setting. This is more healthcare orientated. I do at the bottom of the screen show you, they're just coming out with a uh, consolidated framework 2.0. And they've interviewed all the people that have been using it to, to innovate and to tweak it to be more useful. For one instance, they're calling the intervention characters the innovation. They've expanded the processes. And this is a different thing from Durlach and Dupree. They outline the processes you would use to implement. And they've expanded that. And they're now calling it individuals or providers. And they're breaking out their roles and the char their characteristics. So they have shifted a little bit, but this model still applies. I recommend you go to the research square and uh, see what's happening. They recommend in the article at Research Square that we also admit that these aren't the full list of processes. And there's a whole bunch of frameworks that have been designed to help us understand what processes we have to do to get evidence-based actions adopted. And one of the most famous Canadian that was developed in Canada by Graham and colleagues is the Knowledge to Action Framework. And this is an image of it from the Strategic Policy Branch at Health Canada. But it sort of describes if we want to go from knowledge development to use, all the types of things we might have to do. And they're also starting to talk in the literature about things called implementation support strategies. I would call a lot of these capacity building strategies. Now they have now named all the strategies, categorized them, created a, taxon a taxonomy. And on the right, I'm just showing you something from the Action Schools BC review by Nettlefold that was just published. And we looked through all the documentation, all the reports, everything that was about the practice of implementing action schools in the schools to use the categories and taxonomies to label what was done. So we identified 13 implementation process strategies. Those are things like ongoing consultation, promoting adaptability, technical assistance, local needs assessment. We identified seven capacity building strategy, which is ongoing training, making the training dynamic. And then we uh, looked at scale up strategies. Now I'll talk about this, show you this a bit later. The one thing I do want to emphasize is that we scaled up really before social media became one of the premier ways people were communicating. So we have all these things, implementation support strategies, frameworks that outline the determinants, and then we want to have people implementing at scale. So what is scale up? And scale up is just the deliberate, uh, deliberate efforts to increase the impact of our innovations by spreading it to benefit more people. So we want to do more with more with more sites or in people to influence behavior. It can also be called dissemination. Um, they're pretty interchangeable in my opinion. Some would say they aren't, but it's an active approach of spreading. And there's different types of scale up. There's explosion scale up and horizontal scale up and vertical scale up. But the bottom line is we want more people to use the innovation to reach more people. And scale up pathways aren't all the same. There's quite a bit of research that's been done on this in Australia by the colleagues listed here. One of the things we know is they sometimes scale up, can go right from development all the way to scale up and skip efficacy and effectiveness trial. Those of you who are in physical activity might have heard about the daily mile. That's something that pr practitioners in school systems started out at a school. It started to spread like wildfire, practice to practice, school to school. And the minister 
um, responsible for funding in the UK and health funded it. So it got scaled up immediately across the UK. And the researchers are scrambling to catch up with the evaluation. There's also in public health a pretty common pathway where we develop it, we do a lot of, of pilot and foundational work, and when, then we get to the efficacy trial, and then it gets scaled up. And this is because in public health, often the efficacy trial, there's no place to have a controlled efficacy trial in public health. If you're in a school, you're in a diverse, if you've got 10 schools, you're already in a diverse effectiveness hybrid ef efficacy trial. So sometimes they follow lockstep in that very planned research approach from development to pilot to an effectiveness trial to scale up, but sometimes they, they skip. And then you see the work by Karen Lee up here. Sometimes it's opportunistic. There's funding in place, end of year funding. There's a minister who is really keen on the idea. There's different drivers. Sometimes it comes out of the not-for-profit sector, out of practice, like the Daily Mile. Time frames differ, and the amount of funding really affects. And then the other thing is, are you generating the evidence of what works, or are you using turnkey solutions that have been developed in other jurisdictions or modifying and adapting some solutions that have been find, found elsewhere. Those are two possibilities. There's some simple scale-up frameworks. I'm just going to talk about two. Yami did one for global health. What we really like about this, it's just so simple. It's really um, intuitive. First of all, you need a simple intervention widely agreed to be valuable. In other words, it has relative advantage. You need strong leadership and governance. This matches what we are talking about with this, um, the delivery system in the implementation models. You need active engagement of a range of implementers and the target population or community. That's through development and right through scale up. And then you need to tailor the scale up, up approach to the local situation by cascading or phasing what you're doing. And once again, incorporating research into implementation. So that's very intuitive. And similar to the w health, uh, World Health Organization's scaling up model for health services and innovations by Simmons and Schiffman. And this was developed for health service organizations. It has a number of critical elements. It talks about the innovation, just like the implementation frameworks. It talks about the resource team, those that are going to scale up, which we talked about as the support system. And then it talks about having a scaling strategy and a user organization. And funnily enough, again, ecological, you see there the environment. Now I'm gonna introduce three scale up examples from British Columbia. And um, I'm gonna use the Simmons and Schiffman model to discuss what went on to give you examples. On the right of this slide, it's super, super busy, but those are just articles that you can access afterwards, a sample of related publications, if you wanna dig at the bones of what these initiatives were. The first example is started as Stay Active, Eat Healthy in a BC scaled up solution for unhealthy foods in recreation and sport facilities and became through our study, uh, Heart and Stroke funded study, Eat, Play, Live. Appetite to Play started from the roots in British Columbia of healthy opportunities for preschool, the healthy beginnings toolkit, um, food flare for childcare, became Appetite to Play and the study associated with it is A Good Start Matters. And finally, Action Schools BC, which is targeting K to six, mostly all the research, but uh, uh, it went into the middle schools as well. So those are the three scale up examples. What do these three examples have in common? They all at some time during their scale up had a higher level policy in place, a provincial policy that affected the implementation. They all used a whole of setting, multi-component choice-based model adaptable for the user. And they all implemented capacity building or implementation support strategies. And they led to changes in policies and practices. This mirrors the literature that is cited there that when you have a policy and capacity building, we can see changes in policies and practices. So why talk about these ones as success? Well, we had great reach, right? The, uh, so in Stay Active, Eat Healthy, it crossed 49 municipalities or districts, including 12 First Nations, reaching approximately 150 plus facilities in British Columbia.
It was then scaled out to other provinces through Eat, Play, Live, and we had another 17 facilities affected across three different provinces. It was a first initiative of its kind in North America, and it's still very rare uh, to see them. There's some movement in Australia. In terms of Action Schools BC, the reach was extensive from 2004 to 2015. There were over 5,000 workshops, approximately 500 training workshops a year were delivered. 100% school district involvement. About 90% of the schools were read, more than 90 were registered, but about 90% were at least workshopped. Uh, they introduced student leadership workshops later on in 2006. They delivered 1,400 of those. They reached 87,000 plus workshop participants. They had workshop trainers, about 40,000, 40% 40 of those submitted action plans. So did some of the, the planning. In terms of appetite to play, here's a provincial image of what went on. There are about 195 in-person workshops, 10 virtual workshops, 270 e-learning physical literacy um, courses taken. And that equated to 2,762 early years providers reached across 18 months. So it was significant reach again. And we, this did have the web resource and a lot of tracking associated. So over 25,000 visits over 18 months, about 40% were returning visits. They spent quite a bit of time there. So we had successful scale up. So what did these cases have? Sh Simmons and Schiffman say you need to have theory and research, again, sounding like the implementation frameworks, political will, partnerships, funding, policy, and a broader supportive context. So what did we have in these cases? This is Stay Active, Eat Healthy. In 2005, we started with a provincial audit called Municipal Recreation Food Environment Audit. And we had all these partners involved in the, in the middle and we collected data. It was funded by SHRC. And then eventually the toolkit and capacity building resource was funded by the Ministry of Health. The research goes on, but this is one of the published articles that showed we were selling hot dogs, french fries, chocolate bars, candies, chips, and pop, basically. We had an obesogenic environment. So we had data, we had partnerships, and we had funding. Eat, Play, Live rolled out of that, and we got more funding from the Heart and Stroke Foundation to test the scale-out version and the combination of it with policy. Here, there's also theory-based. We use Lincoln Systems Theory. You can see this is from the Canadian um, Heart Health Project. And then Action Schools. We started out with both horizontal and vertical partnerships. So it went across, uh, across ministries and across not-for-profit and community stakeholders. And it went vertically from school superintendents all the way down to parents and teachers. It also uh, had research embedded. The BC Ministry of Health funded the first efficacy trial, and then we were able to leverage Heart and Stroke and Canadian Institutes of Health research funding. And um, we had a phased approach, and those partnerships went on. Here we look at Dubois' model of dissemination, and you can see that our government community research partner started from the policy phase and rolled all the way through to, to scale up and implementation leading to systems level change. In Appetite to Play, again, this actually utilized existing evidence that policy and capacity building in the early years can change practice and existing resources like Leap BC Hop, Food Fair for Child Care, Healthy Beginnings. There was a stakeholder driven policy right from the development with market research, stakeholders and stakeholder working groups. And there was already a child care licensing regulation. Although in terms of physical activity, it just says you need a certain amount of space and do, um, do gross motor and fine motor activities. So it was very vague. But then during the process of after development, a director of licensing standard of practice for active play was introduced that guided childcare level practice. It's like a regulation. So we had the partnerships, the research, some funding. What other elements? The innovation. Innovations based on Simmons and Shipman should be credible, compatible, flexible, feasible. All the words we saw earlier in implementation. Um, so in Appetite to Play, you see here a multi-component intervention. People could come in where they wanted. There were online 
we now have virtual workshops or in-person recommended practice. There were tools to use. In terms of um, ePlay Live, we had a broad choice-based model that outlined all the areas where food could be served and changed. Three minutes, and in, please. And action schools, um, I'm almost there. And action schools, you saw a whole of setting model. The resource team, um, again, you need credible with the user organization. All our school research, we're finding they really like somebody who's very aware of what the constraints of teaching are. Sometimes your capacity building team has to be teachers. Here we had BCRP involved in Eat, Play, Live. We had people experienced in the school setting and action schools. And we had great or central support units, had good management skills, technical capacity to create resources. And there were scale-up strategies. There were clear message and visibility, strong diffusion channels, early involvement of members of you. We talked about partner organizations. We had adaptability. I'll talk a little bit about more technical assistance and training, and then systematic use of evidence. So what did that look like? I already introduced action schools. There was good strategic use of implementation process strategies, capacity strategies, and scale-up strategies. In terms of stay active, eat healthy, they use assessment and audit initially at centers and providing reports to show facilities what they're doing, small grants, toolkit and resources, orientation training, and ongoing networking across sites and sharing. And in Appetite to Play, again, they had a central support team, a regional trainer model, they refresh content, have social media and newsletters. So did all this scale up actually work? Right? So we know we got scaled up, but what happened? We know from our scale up research and Action Schools BC, even where there was a policy that governed teachers' behavior to provide physical activity introduced called DPA, that a trained teacher, an Action School trained teacher was 2.5 times more likely to provide more than 15 minutes of physical activity in the classroom, snacking on physical activity. In terms of eating, where they didn't roll out a, a healthy eating policy, a, a trained teacher was 6.25 times more likely to have delivered a healthy eating lesson in the last year. In terms of the policy um, in Appetite, in uh, sorry, in Appetite to Play, they had the policy and the capacity building. We see here that we had significant change in policies uh, at the child care center. So all of these are significant and these are introductions and new policies in the child care centers after scale up of the policy and capacity building. In terms of eat, play, live, if you see on the left side, we have guideline provinces and on the right, you have non-guideline provinces. Even at baseline, the guideline provinces um, had more, had less do not sell, significantly less do not sell and more sell sometimes product categories when they were selling um, packaged products. This is snack vending, just in as an example. We think that's because there's some initial communication and capacity building that go on when a policy is released. But this is the interesting piece. Down the left-hand side, you can see capacity building, which is CB, and no capacity building in a guideline province. And we only saw significant change in the amount of sell sometimes and do not sell products that occurred in the further in the capacity building project. And then over on the non-guideline province, you see, of course, they stayed exactly the same. So with no capacity building, the guideline provinces had an advantage, but if they didn't continue with capacity building, they didn't improve. With capacity building, they improved. So not only did we get broad scale up, but we know it worked. So what do we have? Successful scale up based on upstream factors, political will and sustained funding, engagement across multiple sectors and stakeholders, evidence to act on and policy and downstream factors providing training resources and support multiple component designs that allow choice flexibility and adaptability and comprehensive evaluation and community and research partners that bodes well for this meeting and capacity building across that whole time period my final thoughts are that scale up you need to begin scale up right from the beginning with the end in mind because it's all, you can see it's interlinked. It isn't predictable. Sometimes good things don't get scaled up. Um, it is long and most times a time-consuming 
consuming process, but it's going to be absolutely necessary to think about these things as we, we try to shift what has happened to children and youth health behaviors and health issues due to COVID-19. Um, I do have some questions. I just wanted to highlight before the question time that I added into the, um, I added as many resources into the PowerPoint and at the end of the resource, there's a lot of resources there to start people off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robert. You have a standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you. Period of question. I think it's quand même interesting to voir à quel point c'est le prolongement de la discussion sur les données, les solutions, et s'assurer que les solutions sont reprises. Il euh, y a une main levée là. Je, du, on a du temps pour à peu près deux questions. Hi there. Uh, my name is Melanie Henderson. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and researcher. Thanks for the great talk. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on when you have evidence and how is that effective for changing political will? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. When you have evidence, um, well, there's a series of that. So sometimes you get the opportunity, like we did in, um, in the recreation food environment, we had audit data from the province. We had a small amount of funding. And then we had evidence to say, hey, we have a problem. Sometimes it's because you have partnerships. So evidence emerges when you're in partnership the best way. So what happens is if you have your partnerships as you start down the road, what happens is then the, the bureaucrats and the people that are policymakers that are trying to make change, have the evidence at their fingertips, contribute to deciding what kind of evidence you're collecting, and then are seeing it in real time over time. So I would suggest the best way to do it is always in partnership and always making sure you're presenting. Sometimes evidence, um, there are other drivers on policy beyond evidence, as we know, and as we've seen um, in many opportunities. But I think what you do is enhance your likelihood of ev evidence by partnering early if you can. Now, some students and postdocs won't have the kind of connections to be partnering with government. Maybe they're partnering with their local public health authority, um, but sometimes you generate evidence and then try to put it to collaborative meetings. If you have, in BC, we have a physical activity collaborative and there's a research group that advises. And so researchers are involved in that group. So you can place your evidence there so people see it. So it is a little bit about partnering to produce evidence, to partner early and to continually reflect on the evidence over time and then hope. Because if something happens like COVID-19 and you're in the middle of, with really good evidence that physical activity initiative in the school works, we know that other drivers operate in the policy environment. So evidence isn't king. It's one important cog in how policy is made. And um, so does that answer the question? C'est très éclairant. Puis je me permettrais d'ajouter uh, l'importance d'établir des relations, de ne pas attendre de parler à ces gens-là seulement qu'on a des résultats mais de les faire saliver sur des résultats qui s'en viennent en réponse à des questions urgentes. Puis on vient d'augmenter l'intérêt, puis ils reçoivent, euh, ils savent pourquoi ils devraient vous écouter lorsque les résultats sont là. Thank you very much for your time and the quality of your presentation.